Homeowners insurance providers can give you a quote online, but you know what they can't give you? What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. Come. 
So take me as you find me All my fears and failures Fill my life again I give my life to follow Everything I believe in And now Sorry. Hello, everyone. I forgot to unmute myself there. I hope you're uh, having a good evening, and uh, it's great to have you with us today. Antoinette, I see that you're on. Thank you so much. And if anyone else is on, it really helps me to see you if you just give a little uh, hello in the chats, and uh, and then I get a chance to uh, say hello back to you. Uh, well, it's Wednesday night. It's a beautiful night here in Cape May. Uh, I hope you're doing well wherever you are, and I hope you're enjoying the beginning of this summer season. And uh, we're just um, very excited at what God is doing. Um, I am getting up my um, my PowerPoint teaching here. So give me just a second. Um, and tonight we are in the book of Genesis and we're going through um, Genesis chapter two. We did a little bit of this last week. And uh, I wanna uh, talk to you about uh, a couple things. Um, the, the Garden of Eden itself, and uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life and uh, so i'd like to take it in that and uh tonight um oh wait that's hold on let me get my slideshow going there we go all right let me go back to this okay and uh, here we are we're in Genesis chapter 2. Uh, we're talking about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. By the way, um, just a quick word. If you would like to give to this ministry, please go to org forward slash donate. Or you could text to give at 609-400-4075. And we appreciate your, your faithfulness in giving to this ministry. Um, I want to start by reading um, the second part of Genesis chapter 2. And um, you can follow along with me here. 
Uh, I'm starting with verse 4. I'm going to read to verse 24. And it says, And these are the generations of the heavens of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. When there was no brush of the field, yet in the land there was no, there was no brush of the field, yet in the land there was no small plant of the field, and had uh, field had yet sprung up. For the Lord had not caused it to rain on the land. Um, and there was no man to work the ground. And the mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. And then the Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground and breathed to his nostrils the breath into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put uh, the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made a spring up of every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And a tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first place was Phison, and uh, and it is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold that is in the land is good. Uh, Bedilim and Onyx Stone are there. The name of the second river is Geishin. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is Tyrus, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You shall, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat it, you shall surely die. Um, so, hold on, here's something. All right, uh, come on, go back. All right. Um, here I am. Okay. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is location, location, location. And that's what they say in uh, real estate business, right? Um, and, um, and and I want to talk about uh, location. This is, uh, this is very interesting. Apparently, there was, a, there was a place called Eden. And in a smaller area, in Eden, God planted this garden, and out of Eden flowed these rivers that went that watered the garden, and the plants grew up. And God put man in this location, um, and this this is really um, really very important because all through the Old Testament, God deals with locations. God deals with well, if you want to worship me, you got to come to this location. You got to be in this location. Got to be in this place. Uh, so. Um, in, it first started in Eden. God said, "Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna put you in Eden, and that's where I'm gonna meet you." Now, God God has said, "Look, I made the whole world." Remember, we talked last week where we basically said the whole world, and uh, maybe even all of creation was made for human beings, right? Made made to um, what well, all of the physical creation that we see anyway um, was made for human beings, and God was working everything and making everything and any planet man in the garden. Well, God could have said, uh, I want you to go, uh, here's the world and you can go wherever you want. God said, I want you to meet me in the garden. I want you to tend to the garden, live in the garden, meet me in the garden. This is the place where you're going to meet with me. Um, we see this all through the Old Testament that like there were certain places uh, before there was a tabernacle, there was altars. And um, uh, we see this with Jacob where he sees a vision of God and he builds an altar there. And at different times in his life, he goes to meet God there. Um, we see this with Abraham where he built altars and he met God at these altars and these places became sacred places and important places. And then when we get to the book of Ex Exodus, God tells um, Moses, to build a tabernacle. Um, those of you who follow me know that I've talked about the tabernacle a lot, not in detail as far as what each furnishing meant, but just the idea of the tabernacle, uh, that it was a place to meet God. And um, when you get to the tabernacle in Exodus, a lot of the same language is used of the tabernacle that's used um, 
for Eden. Uh, in, in other words, God says, okay, well, before you met me in the garden and then you fell, and now I need a new place for my presence to be on earth. And so they made the tabernacle. Uh, that tabernacle eventually turned into the temple, and the temple was on top of Mount Zion. And Mount Zion was in the city of Jerusalem. Um, and so um, you start to see this language in the Old Testament where uh, God would meet his people in Jerusalem. And uh, it, it actually, the prophets talked about, uh, I believe Isaiah and also Ezekiel talked about um, uh Zion, Mount Zion, being like the Garden of Eden. They use the same language again. Well, what's key to the Garden of Eden isn't that it's just a garden. What makes it a paradise is that they meet God there, that God is there, and God is with them, that God comes and talks to man in the cool of the day, uh, that God is with them. And, of course, this relationship is broken once uh, Adam uh, disobeys God. So, um, so then there's this, uh, then, you know, as it gets later in the old Testament, it is the temple, the place where you meet God. Um, interestingly, uh, um, enough, uh, when, um, Ezekiel gives this vision going through the book of Ezekiel at different times gives this vision of the presence of God in the temple. Then it lifts from the te temple of God and then it's, and then it leaves the temple of God. Um, and when it leaves the temple of God, that's when he, he is predicted that the Babylonians are going to come in and destroy the place. But where does the presence of God go? The presence of God goes to the east. Well, what's in the east? Babylon, where the people of God were taken. And so before the people of God, even in the God's judgment, before uh, they went to Babylon, they followed the presence of God there, and uh, God would meet them even in a strange place. Well, in the New Testament, you ask the question, well, where's the place for us? Do we make a pilgrimage to, to uh, Jerusalem? Uh, it's, it'd be nice to take a trip, and many Christians have, but is that required of us? No. Uh, our temple, it, our Eden, is Christ. Christ is our Eden. And here's the idea. We can't just meet God anywhere and any way we want to. We, ha we have to come to God through Christ. Christ is the only way we can come to God. And so we even see from the beginning where God is saying, you're going to meet me at a place. You're going to meet me uh, where, where I say you can meet me. And now that place is Christ. And we know uh, this language is used of Christ himself, where he said, uh, you cannot tear down this temple, and in three days I'll build it back up again. And it clearly says in the Gospels that he was talking about his body. Uh, this was so clear, what Jesus was saying, that it was one of the things that was evidence that brought him uh, to his death, uh, because they actually said, he said you could rip down the temple in three days and rebuild it. Uh, what, what, was, what was he saying? He was saying, I'm greater than this physical building, the temple. He was really saying that he is the temple. He clearly said that. He is the temple. What is the temple? The meeting place where we meet with God. And so in the Garden of Eden, people met with God. Adam and Eve met with God talked with God, communed with God. Uh, their separation from God made them be uh, be cast out of the, the garden. But then God said, okay, I'll give you other places. I'll give you altars, places to meet with me. Uh, I will reach out to you. I will come to you. And then he gives him a tabernacle, and then he gives him a temple, and then finally he gives us Christ. Christ is our temple. Um, Paul says, all the fullness of the Godhead is found in Christ. Um, and, and that means um, uh, all that, that, that is God is found in Christ. Uh, John um, 1, 1 uh, says the word was with God and the word was God. Uh, so um, we are clearly seeing that. Jesus says, um, if you've seen me, You've seen the Father. So Jesus is the meeting place with God. And this is good news because we don't have to travel to a temple, go up to a mountain, go find some, some sacred place where God's presence is. In fact, um, I love our church. 
And I encourage you now that we're getting to the end of COVID to be in church because there's something about getting together as a body of believers. But one thing I can't say is, well, our sanctuary has God's presence in a in a unique way. Um, it may feel that way, or when I go in and I look at the big cross on the wall, uh, I may be able to use that as a means of grace to help me feel closer to God. Uh, but God's presence isn't there like it was in the temple because now um, the temple that we go to is Christ himself. He is our temple, and this is such good news. You can find Christ in a dungeon. You can find Christ in the most uh, horrific place in the world. You can find Christ there uh, uh, and um, because that's where his presence is. His presence is where his people are. And so we come to Christ. Um, and um, and that is where God's located. God is located in Christ. Um, uh, let, let me even go go a little bit further here because let me take this a little bit deeper. The, um, the city of Zion, Jerusalem, um, the, the mountain of Zion, Jesus was crucified right outside the city. Remember, the city of Zion was related to, to the Garden of Eden, right? The, God, God used this language with the prophets that if you're in Jerusalem, you're in Mount Zion, you're in the Garden of Eden, you're, you're like, the, it's kind of like the new Garden of Eden, but not the paradise that it was, but it's the place where God met his people. Well, outside of that garden, outside of the place where it all starts, outside of the place where the sin uh, happened, uh, spiritually speaking, not the physical place, but the, outside of the place uh, that God called the garden, um, Jerusalem, Christ was crucified. Uh, man was cast out of the garden, and Jesus, uh, you could kind of say, comes out of the paradise uh, to where we are and is crucified outside of the paradise. He comes to us. You know, in other words, we couldn't go back to the garden and say, God, redeem us. We're sorry. Uh, forgive us. We, we, we had no power to do that. So what does God do? He comes out of the garden. He comes out of the place of paradise to the place where we are. And outside of that garden, he is crucified. Uh, the gospel writer said he is crucified in a place called the skull. Uh, now, um, some archaeologists found a place that actually looks like a skull, this hill. And the mountain, the way it's carved out, you know, by nature, kind of looks like a human skull, um, which is interesting. It could be the place where Christ was crucified. Um, but uh, there's, there's really also something really interesting about this. Um, the earliest Christian writers... Um, thought of the place of the skull as the place where Adam was buried, the first Adam. So there's, there's a, Paul talks about two Adams. Uh, the first Adam brought us sin and death, but the second Adam brings us righteousness. Uh, so, so there's a first Adam, and that Adam is Adam. The second Adam is Christ. Christ is the second Adam. So, so he doesn't just bring forgiveness for our sins. He creates a whole new mankind. Um, and so the earliest Christian fathers thought, well, Christ was crucified uh, over the, the place. I don't know if they literally thought this or if it was like a spiritual thing, but they, they say Christ is crucified at the place of the skull, the, the place where Adam was buried, and he's crucified in that same place. And so you have the old Adam uh, who brought sin and death, and the new Adam who brings life. And then you could say there's a third race of people. So if you want to you know what the cure to racism is, races, the cure to racism is Christ, because Christ creates a third race of people, and these are, people are the people of God, the people who are redeemed, uh, the people who are set free from their sins, and all are welcomed into this race of people. doesn't matter how much pigment is in your skin. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're light skin, dark skin, olive skin. It doesn't matter what your culture is. Uh, you are invited to be part of this new race of people who are the people of God, who are forgiven, who are set free, who are um, who are redeemed by God's power, uh, by the power of Jesus Christ, the power of the cross, the power of His resurrection. 
there on the place of the skull, the, uh, the, the old Adam was put to death and the new Adam rises to life. And that's really exactly what happens in our Christian life. Our old self is put to death. Our new self is raised to life and Christ redeems us, redeems us. Um, so uh, there's a lot there. So the the first thought I wanted to bring to you was the idea of location. And uh, and I I have been talking and not really taking you through my PowerPoint that I worked so diligently to put together. Um, uh, so I'll just read it. Even though God made everything, he chooses a, spe a specific place to set a part for, for his blessing. Uh, at, he puts Adam and Eve in the garden. Israel, he put in the temple. For us, God is found in Christ. Uh, Paul says, all the fullness of the Godhead is found in Christ. Um, God has located himself in Christ. Um, this is what I said about Zion. Crucifixion takes place outside the city. Skull. Um, okay, so the second thing I want to talk about is substance. Um, and I want to talk about two trees, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And um, first of all, I want to talk about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I want to change your thinking a little bit on it. Um, if you look at this, you think, well, this, this, this um, tree must have been um, kind of kind of a curse to put there you know this it's like this temptation god put there right in the middle of the garden and god why would god do that uh but i want you to kind of turn around and think of this a different way the tree of life i'm, I'm sorry the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was a blessing because it was an act of worship every time they went to the middle of the garden and there's there's two trees here the tree of life the tree of the knowledge of good and evil every time they went there they had an opportunity to worship god they had an opportunity to choose life, and uh, and they uh, and God placed this sacred tree in a garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, to say, okay, we're going to choose today to trust God, to put our hope in Him, to put our confidence in Him, and so we're not going to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now I don't know if the tree of knowledge of good and evil would have been there forever uh, if uh, Adam and Eve had not sinned. Um, I, I don't know if, um, if, if God would have just taken it away eventually, um, that's speculation, <laughs> uh, but, um, but God didn't place it there to be a curse. God placed it there to be a blessing. God placed it there for an opportunity for obedience, the opportunity to show love. When we worship God, we're showing love to God. We're being obedient to him. And we're also putting our trust in him. And that's a gift. That's a that's a that's a wonderful gift that God has given us. Um, uh, I want to uh, just um, think about the garden and all the trees, right? Uh, so God said uh, God's first commandment, uh, and you, we'll see this in the next chapter. God says, "You may eat of any tree that's in the garden, except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil." And so. When um, when uh, Adam is in uh, Adam and Eve are in the garden, the first command of God isn't to be restrictive, right? God God doesn't say, you know, you can only eat of this one tree and don't touch this and don't touch that. It was it was actually no, uh, be a blessing, be fruitful and multiply, and eat of any tree you want, uh, except for this one, and I'm going to hold this back as an opportunity for you to worship me. Um, and, and for you to experience God, for you to experience trust in me. Um, and so um, the first thing God wanted us to see, even in our perfect state, was that we could not sustain ourselves. We, we have no ability to sustain ourselves. We have to look outside of ourselves to live. So there was this tree of life that they had to eat from to keep on living. There was these other trees that subsid that gave them substance, that gave them food for eating. Uh, that that like they couldn't just say, uh, Adam couldn't say, well, I don't need food. 
Um, and, and think about that. Um, you would think, well, God could have created us in a perfect state where we had no f- need of food whatsoever. Uh, and yet we had to depend on something outside of ourselves to live. So every time you get hungry, your body is preaching a sermon to you. Your body is reminding you, reminding you that you need God, that you are not self-sufficient. It uh, doesn't matter how rich you are, how much stuff you have, how much stuff you have acquired. You cannot decide, well, I'm not going to drink water and eat anymore because I don't need it anymore. You still need it. You still need something outside of yourself to live. And God wanted us to know, uh, not only do we need food and water, we need him. What does he do? What does Jesus do to describe what he's done for us? He takes us to a table and says, this is my body, which is given for you. This is my blood, which is given for you. Jesus describes himself as water, uh, the water of life. Uh, He describes himself as the bread of life. Um, These are all things that are really basic, right, to live. We need water and bread, or we need water and food to live. And if we don't have these things, we will die. We die very quickly. Um, uh, The Holy Spirit, I, I mean, you can even take this further. The Holy Spirit is called the breath of God, right? The um, the word for breath is the same thing uh, as the spirit. So, just like I breathe, I need the presence of God. And if I stop breathing, I, I only live maybe a few minutes at the most, uh, and and I die a horrible death. I die of suffocation. And it's the same thing. We need God. We need the breath of God, the spirit of God. We need we need uh, the the uh, bread of Christ. Uh, we need the uh, we we need the the, the blood of Christ, um, and Jesus describes as as uh, he, he actually says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, right? Which people just got really freaked out about. But what he was saying was this: He is our very substance. He is everything we need. And there, in the middle of this garden, God said, "You aren't you, you got and and this is in our perfect state." Uh, this is before sin. God said to us, uh, you're not going to be able to live uh, just in and of yourself. You're going to have to eat. You're going to have to eat of these trees. Who provided the trees? God did. And, uh, and, and so from the very beginning, God says, you're going to live within my provision. And you're going to be sustained within my provision. Um, so... God could have created us as creatures that don't need food at all, but we need food because we need God, and we need God just like we need food. Um, so uh, life comes from outside of us. So let's t- talk about tree and kn- knowledge of good and evil. When you just talk about knowledge of good and evil, it's really just talking about the future event that's going to come. When uh, God could have called the tree anything, and I don't believe the fruit had any sort of magic in it. I don't think there was anything, probably not even in the tree of life, that there was a particular magic to these trees. Where their power came from was what the word of God that, that was subscribed to them. Uh, God said, this is a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, this is just a tree of life. Uh, one gives you life, one gives you death. You can, and and uh, this language is found in Deuteronomy. Again, you know, God gives you blessings and God gives you curses. Choose this day, life. Um, and, and it's the same thing, that the same choice that God is uh, giving to us today. Our life is in Christ. Um, and that same choice, we could choose life or we could choose death. We have the same choice of Adam and Eve. He said, you eat this tree, you will surely die. But if you eat of the tree of life, you will live. Um, so um, why is it called tree of knowledge of good and evil? Because they would learn the difference between good and evil by doing evil, by by rejecting God, by turning their backs on God. Um, life is a life of faith and trust and obedience. Evil is a life of distrust and disobedience. And when we get into the temptation, we're going to see the core of, temptation that they were dealing with was, can I trust God? Um, and and so um, this tree was an expression, as I mentioned, an expression to worship God. Every day they saw this tree, they could say, I'm going to worship God by not eating of this fruit. Um, and so, um, and, 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 and 
I mean, we could um, we could put a tree up in in our church and say, okay, this tree of knowledge of good and evil. We're not going to eat of this. We're going to dedicate this tree to God. And you can say that's what the tree of knowledge of good and evil really was meant to be, a tree of food dedicated to God. Like, this isn't for me. This is, an, this is my opportunity to worship God by surrendering this tree to him. Um, some other things I don't want to get, but um, I, and, and so um, let me see where I am on my PowerPoint. We're going to wrap this up. There's a lot of deep stuff here, just rich stuff, I should say. Um, everything that sustains us comes from outside of ourselves. Um, our bodies are preaching a sermon to us. And, uh, and when we get to the tree of life, um, first of all, let's talk about God's mercy here. He says to them, he says, God speaks to himself in Genesis chapter three. Uh, when we get there, we'll talk more about it. But God speaks to himself as the Trinity. And he says, if we, um, now that man uh, knows good and evil, uh, and he eats of the tree of life, he will live. So we have to um, take him out of the garden, take him away from the tree. And, um, and this, believe it or not, um, is an act of grace not an act of judgment because now he's saying um now people are going to mankind humankind they're gonna they're gonna start to think in evil ways they're gonna think in self-centered ways and and one of the worst things that can happen to us is that we live forever in a self-centered egotistical um uh way without humility um we could do a whole study on hell and we should do that soon. But the key part of hell isn't uh, the flame. And I don't know if it's literal or not, but the key part of it is um, uh, the key part of it is um, living a self-centered life without God for all, all of eternity. That life becomes more and more um, isolated. Uh, it becomes more and more uh, torturous. And God, out of his mercy, said there's going to have to, be, have to be an end to this because if they could live forever, then, um, then, then things will just get uh, really um, – things will not just get evil, but things would become hellish um, because we would be stuck in a way of living for ourselves – instead of living for God and living for others. And uh, where where I just would point this out is in um, the story in um, Luke chapter 19, uh, where there's a rich man that goes to uh, the place of torment, and there's a poor man that stat, stood at his, sat at his gate every day, and the guy was just indifferent to him. Both of them died, and the, the poor guy was named Lazarus. He went to... Um, uh, the place of paradise. The rich guy's not named, which is interesting because his identity was in his riches. And uh, what he says to Abraham, he can yell over to Abraham and he says, send Lazarus to warn my brothers. And there's two things there that we see that's really key about uh, what hell is like. Uh, the, um, the man in hell still thinks Lazarus is his servant. You see that he's not capable of coming to a place of repentance. He has given into his complete selfishness. And, and all of his thoughts are about himself. And then he says, well, send him to warn my brothers. Uh, and uh, Abraham says, they have the law and the prophets. Uh, and he said, no, if someone would come back from the dead. And so the man's saying, you know, the reason why I'm in here is I didn't have enough information. If I had this information, I wouldn't be here. Um, and this great phrase, well, they won't believe even if someone comes back from the dead. And who came back from the dead? Jesus. And there are people that saw the risen Christ and didn't believe. Um, and there, there are all kinds of proofs that we can talk about that Jesus rose from the dead. And some people really believe he rose from the dead and still don't believe. Um, so anyway, my little rabbit trail there. I want to take us to Revelation chapter 22. 
uh, this is where we see the tree of life again. And uh, and this is just so awesome. And I'm going to end here. Uh, angel, uh, uh, chapter 22 says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God into the Lamb. And through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, was uh, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, uh, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the trees were for the healing of nations. No longer will be the, anything be a curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. And this is where we see the tree of life again. In the end, where God uh, God isn't just making things better. He's making things new. Um, he said, let's say, um, we can imagine the worst thing that ever happened to us, that ever happened to anyone. Uh, he, he doesn't say, well, we know that was bad, but you have all eternity to get over it. No, what he's saying is, I'm going to make all things new. The things that happen to you, the mistakes that you've made, the th ways that you've been hurt, that's going to pass away, and I'm going to make all things new. Um, we're not going to have the lingering regrets. We're not going to have the lingering uh, awful memories of things that have happened to us because God is going to make all things new and the tree of life will be there. Uh, and, and so we don't just see God restoring us to the Garden of Eden. He makes all things better. So I'll leave you with that today. There's a lot of stuff here, but I would ask you to please um, uh, share, like, and share this. And also, um, if you go to my personal YouTube page, uh, I'm loading all these up there. So just look for Leo Dodd on YouTube and you can watch these again or share them with people. Really appreciate that. Pray you God, God just bless you guys today and, uh, have a wonderful evening. Uh, Teen Challenge will be with us again this week on Sunday, and we look forward to having them. God bless you and we'll see you Sunday.